Some months ago I introduced to you the Keith Titanium Wood Stove. Well, since that time I've done quite a bit of work with this and I think I'm ready to give you the full review. If you're interested, keep watching. Okay, before we get started, I just want to mention that I'm not going to include any footage of using this wood stove with wood in this video. And the reason is, is because I've got enough material to cover that it'll take a bit of time and I don't want to make the video too long. So what I would recommend you do is that you go back to that original video where I introduced the wood stove. I was out in the woods and I was using it with wood. I'll put a link to that video up here in the corner and of course at the end of the video as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take this stove apart. I'll put it back together to show you it being assembled. We'll talk a little bit about the specifications. I'm going to talk about its other, its use with other fuels other than wood. And then I'm going to show you a few comparisons with a few other stoves that roughly are in the same market or the same concept range. Okay, here's how the stove arrives when you buy it in this nice nylon pouch. It's actually quite a nice nylon pouch, nicer than a lot of the ones the, the stoves come in that I receive. It's, uh, it's got the little Keith logo right here on the end, which is a nice touch. Zipper closed, not Velcro, which is also kind of nice. Let's take a few of the components out. Now, just a quick thing I want to show you here, and that is I have stacked all the plates so that the bottom, if it were assembled, these would be the, bo the bottom of the plates, are all in one direction. And that gives me a little recess here. So just from experience, what that allows me to do is to get the plates in and out of the envelope just a little easier because the zipper doesn't run the full length of the envelope. So you, it's nice to have that little bit of a gap there just to get it in and out. All right, let's set the, pa the pouch aside. So you get the stove, you have, that would be the front, this would be the back, and two sides. And I'm going to mention the sides again in a minute. The sides are where the larger feed ports are, and they're going to be important for handling the stove once it's assembled. So let me start with the back. And now what's interesting about the back, I'm calling the back the one that actually has the Keith logo on it. And you'll see why in a minute. So I have uh, my stove dirtied up from quite a bit of use and I like to turn the dirty sides in just to keep things clean. It's always cleaned after use, of course, but... So now I have three sides assembled, or two sides and a back, and I have, there's my front piece. And now it's time to put in the fire grate and the ash pan. So on each of the fire grate and ash pan, there are tabs on three sides. You can see those tabs there. And they'll match up with recesses or cutouts on each of the three sides that I have in my hands right now. So again, it's one of these stoves that you have to learn how to assemble. A little bit of practice goes a long ways. And then you'll, you'll get this, the hang of it and you'll be faster each time. I put in the ash pan first. The notches that the tabs go into are loose enough that it makes it easy for them to go in without having any struggles. There's my fire grate. My fire grate goes in. A little bit of hand-eye coordination here. And they are held in. Now, you have to hold the sides together with one hand or the other when you go to attach the last plate. So the last plate I'm calling the front plate. Uh, it, it, you'll notice that on each of these there are three interlocking notches and that's great from the point of view that they seem to resist warping or they assist with holding the stove together and resist warping a great deal. It just adds a small bit of complexity when you go to line up this last plates because you have to have three sets of notches lined up. Of course that doesn't take very long, just a little bit of a, again, hand-eye coordination. Sometimes a little bit more than others. One, two, three. I think we're all lined up. Missing something here. There, I think we got it now. Oh, there we go. Missed one. All right, so they're all installed. Now, you can see the stove is very stable once it goes together. Still, I recommend, and here's where those side plates come in again, the ones with the large feed port, that once you get the stove put together, if you're going to move it from one place to another, especially if you're going to put it where you want it to be used, grab it from the sides, one side or the other, or both sides. Those sides being, again, the ones with the large feed port. This will ensure that it doesn't fall apart on you. Uh, it's unlikely to do that anyway, but just to be sure, grab it from the sides, even 
and more important, if you had to move this during operation, for whatever reason, then you're going to want to, again, grab it through those ports. Now, of course, you're not going to do it with your hands or even gloved hands if it's an operation, but you could do it with a couple of sticks. Just stick a couple of sticks in, lift the stove up, and move it, and you, you can be assured that it's not going to fall apart on you. Okay, there's one more component which is an additional cross member that goes across the center of the top of the opening. Give you a little bit of a close up how that cross member went in there. And of course that's there for to support pots that are smaller than the size of the opening of the stove. And I'll give you some specifications on that in one second. All right, so there's the stove ready for operation with wood. Now, let me just give you a few specifications on the stove. So the overall height of the stove is 6.3 inches from bottom to top, or 16 centimeters. It is 4.4 inches, or 11.2 centimeters across, and it is square. There is a burn chamber depth of 5 and... 5.12 inches or 13 centimeters down to the fire grate. And the weight of this is 11.2 ounces or 318 grams. And of course, all those specifications will be in the video description underneath this uh, video. Okay, so there we are ready to use for wood. So it is designed primarily for wood, but like all of my stoves, if I can get a multi-fuel use out of them, then I feel it's a much more versatile stove. So I worked with this for a while to see how I could set up for use with an alcohol stove. Obviously, with a fire plate or fire grate that deep into the stove, a transgia, you know, far exceeds the distance you want to your pot. So I had to be able to raise one of the plates up to a point where the distance is closer to that one inch or one and a quarter inches, whatever you prefer to use. So I'm going to show you what I did. I have to take the stove apart slightly to set it up for that. I'm going to show you what I did, and then I'm going to show you an alternative that requires no machining whatsoever. All right, give me one second. Okay, to set it up for a tranji, and I'm using my Alex burner here, to set it up for a stove of that style, you do have, or at least I thought in the beginning, that I had to do some machining. So let me take it apart and I'll show you what I did. On each of these three plates, I measured down from the top the distance it was that is required to have the stove sit and still give you that one to one and a quarter inch gap to the top of the stove. I'll put that measurement in the in the show notes rather than uh, give it to you now. And then what I did is, and yes, there's a bit of work to doing this, is I made a mark on the side of the stove lined up with each of the other plate notches, the two down here, and drilled it out with a carbide drill and used a very small file to create an additional notch. So you can see now I have three notches on each of those sides. I guess as a quick reference, you can see where the Keith name is underneath their logo, and that's where the, the notch height is that works the best, so that makes it easy, but I would recommend you use the measurement I, I'll give you in the video description. And what that allows me to do now is I can take either the fire grate or the ash pan. I prefer the fire grate because it does give more airflow, of course. I can put it back in the same way I would have in the lower slot, so right there at this height, and replace the front plate again. I went together as the way it's supposed to be, nice and quick. So now I have the fire grate at a good height where I can take my burner, place it inside, and you can see it's at a much better height now for use with an alcohol stove. So great, now I have a stove that I can use at least two fuels with. Okay, so there is a few things to mention. I looked at this and I thought, is this cross member going to get in the way if I want to add or, or use my... Uh, my snuffer. Uh, if you're using a trangia, trangia doesn't come with this little extension like Alec and, and a number of the, the other ones come with. This is great because I can, even with that cross member in place, reach in through the side, get on top of the stove and snuff it out or use it as a simmering as it's intended, either way. But of course that's not doable, well it could be doable, it's just a lot more work to do without uh, that little extension, the little leaf, the little handle on it. So I looked at this for a bit and I thought, okay, you know, if my pot is big enough to cover the entire top, I don't have to worry. I can just 
drop my snuffer in or my simmer ring in and no problems. But if I'm using something smaller than the diameter, and I'll put a couple pots on this to, in a minute just to show you relative size, then I need some way of supporting the pot without, uh, or support, yeah, supporting the pot without getting in the way of putting, using the snuffer. So what I came up with was, and this is probably not something that everybody will have, I was just fortunate to have, these are fire sticks that go with the firebox stove. These are titanium fire sticks because of course I purchased a titanium firebox which I have yet to review and I purchased extra sticks because yeah you just don't want to lose them right so I got an extra set of sticks. They work perfectly on top of the stove from either direction and it wasn't designed for this of course but look at this let me show you up close take the burner out. Those little recesses those little right at the top there, they line up just nicely so that the fire sticks can lay in. They're now flush with the top of the stove and uh, they're not going to fall off or, at all. All right, so if you don't have a set of fire sticks, is there something else you can use? Well, I made fire sticks, or I made at least one for demonstration purposes, and I have a video on this. If you happen to lose one of the fire sticks for your firebox, and it's not that they're expensive, they're not very expensive at all, the original fire sticks. However, if you lose one and you don't want to just pay shipping for one small item, because for me in Canada, the shipping was costing me more than it would have for the fire sticks, I made a replacement out of a skewer. So this is a flat skewer from our dollar store, Dollarama. And I just cut it to size. It even has a little bit of a bump on the end, just like the fire sticks do. And uh, it works perfectly as a fire stick. So a pair of those would also work across the top of the stove. If you don't have that or you don't want to be bothered with that, but you do have a couple of aluminum tent pegs, then same thing. You can put those. I like the triangular ones because, of course, round ones will roll. But the triangular ones, again, lay across to the stove. It gives me a little bit more height, so it depends on what you want in terms of height between the, your, your burner and your pot. But they'll work well as well. And they won't be in direct line with the flame. So I know some people, myself included, there, there is a bit of an effect, now not with a small piece of titanium like this, but if you have a large piece of metal covering over the flame, there is a bit, bit of a heat sink that occurs from an alcohol stove. It takes a while longer to bring something to a boil because, of course, any metal that's between you and the pot has to be heated before the heat is transferred up into the pot and onto the water. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you now what I came up with after I did that machining because I'm about to save you no mach any machining whatsoever. It's just going to be a little different. It wasn't something that's obvious when I looked at the stove. But just before I do, one other advantage of the fire sticks is just like with the firebox, moving the stove. So if you have a set of fire sticks or you want to purchase an extra set, if you happen to want to buy the Keith stove, set of fire sticks go a long way for being a great accessory to go with. Okay, now let me put a few of these things aside. I want to show you what I did that, or what I discovered, I guess, that requires no machining and still allows you to use an alcohol stove. So front plate comes off. I take the, the fire grate out now. Without disassembling those three pieces, I'm turning the stove upside down. So it's a little different. And what I discovered is you can see these air holes that are on all three sides, not on the, on the last side, but on the three sides that I'm using now are these air holes. Well, it turns out that this center air hole, which is the same in all three sides, if you take your fire grate, put it in there, then put the last side on. Now, of course, you're doing this upside down, so I'm going to have to tip it back to assemble the last one on. There, okay, it's on. And now it will move within that opening, so once you get that last plate on, there's a good chance you'll just have to level it off a little bit. Now look, do you know what? It's exactly the same height as the notches I created on to hold it with the stove in the upright position. So now, I can take my alcohol burner, place it inside, and to the top of the stove, I've got exactly one inch clearance. So the only challenge that you have with doing it this way 
is that if you're using a pot smaller than the opening of the stove, again, you're going to need some kind of a support on top to, to hold the smaller pot on. So again, referring back to my fire sticks, if I lay them right across the top, then I'll have an inch, um, an inch and an eighth is about up to the pot. But I don't like doing that because, of course, they're, they're, they're subject to falling off or being knocked off. But there are notches built in the bottom of the stove that don't lock your pot stands in, but they do allow it to sit in there without falling off. Now you are reducing your height to about three quarters of an inch. Your alcohol stove will still work. It'll just take a little longer to reach the boil. And what's the rush, right? So this allows me to have a, a, a stand for a smaller pot that's actually adjustable to the pot size to a certain degree, of course. I had no machining to do whatsoever in order to achieve that. So now I've got a working uh, alcohol stove to go with my Keith wood stove. One other side benefit is there's more solid sides to the stove when it's in, inverted like this and that means you've got a little bit less influence from the wind but you still have air that will enter that needs to be there to feed the alcohol stove. All right before I do anything else what I'm going to do now is flip the stove back up put this plate back into, uh, let's use the original wood burning position. Take me a second. Line it up the tabs. And again, just a little bit of fiddling, especially if you're just getting used to using it. Holding everything together. Replace the front. All right. Okay, I'm just going to grab a, two pots and I'll bring them back and I wanted to show you the relative size of different pots on top of the stove. Okay, I just quickly grabbed two pots off of the shelf here that I can show you two sizes. So the ideal height is for using a pot that covers the, or spans the entire width of the stove. It's something that is 14 centimeters or greater. Now this is just a little stainless steel kettle that I have, but it is a 14 centimeter pot. So any 14 centimeter pot will go across to the stove and be just perfect. So I did try this with my 12 centimeter zebra and it's just just sits on and to the point where I wouldn't trust it without putting that center cross member in to support it you know a little bit off one side or the other so 14 centimeters or larger and that includes things like the Pathfinder bush pot and the Moore's bush pot or the Solo 1800 pot those are all 14 centimeters or 14 centimeter zebra pot of course so that works well now what if I've got something smaller like the Stanley cook pot or maybe one of the 750 mil pots that's when you're going to want to use that cross member now for this demonstration I just grabbed a GSI uh, glacier mug and it is the smaller you know I think they're a little less than 10 centimeters but you can see that if it's off one side or the other it's not going to work but if you put it to one side it's perfectly supported and if you're using an alcohol stove, you can just shift the alcohol stove to the front or the back on the plate where it's resting and you'll get the more direct flame on the bottom of the pot. So that works well. Again, if I'm not using this centerpiece or if any time I lost it, which is, you know, something small like that could go missing and I want to use my fire sticks, then that's even better. That just works perfectly. They, you know, it, it centers it as well. Okay, so now I've showed you the stove set up for use with two fuels. I'm going to talk about two more fuels and then I'm going to show you a fourth fuel that you can use with this stove. So I have used this with charcoal. It is excellent. This works really well with charcoal. It has sufficient airflow through the bottom of the fire grate and on three sides where those holes exist. So it works really well with charcoal. Not so well with pellets, not without modification. And there's a couple reasons. One, there are the holes in the bottom of the fire grate. Now, if you do dump pellets in, a lot of times they jam themselves up and only a few of them will fall through. So you, I could use it with that, but those side holes are big and you won't jam pellets up there. So there is only about a little over half an inch between the fire grate and the openings here. So you're not gonna get very many pellets in. Yes, I could modify this with creating a screen that I could put down a side that comes up three sides and covers those holes. But, uh, and you know, I may do that just as an experiment to see if it's something that's worth doing. But in the short term, I'm not disappointed that I can't use pellets in this effectively. 
because it works so well with wood, it works so well with charcoal, it works so well with alcohol. Now I'm going to show you the last fuel that it works well with as well. Okay, so some time ago I released a video where I demonstrated an alloc stove, a very different looking alloc stove that was based on an ancient Chinese charcoal burner. If you're interested, uh, you'll find that in my playlist for stick stoves. And one of the things that I really liked about that stove, beyond the fact that it could be used with charcoal, wood, alcohol, is the fact that it could be used with a butane gas cylinder. Now I just forgot to grab my cylinder. So one of these, you know, a different size butane gas cylinders, butane propane combination mixes. And the burner that I used in it is this one. And uh, this came off of another stove and I've kept the burner just for this purpose because it works great in a couple of different stoves, including this one, which I'll show you in a second. Now, if you don't happen to have one of these, uh, you can purchase them. I have found them on AliExpress. I can't seem to find the link for just the unit as it exists right here. However, what I did find and very common, and again, I referred to this in that Alex stove video is a link for another inexpensive remote feed stove like this. So this one is fairly common on AliExpress uh, and it would be other places as well. It has fold out legs then drop down feet and it has that burner plate, it has the, the igniter on the side. You know, it's a good look, working little stove. It's not very expensive, uh, but it works very well. Well, what I discovered is, is underneath here, there are screws that hold the rest of this assembly on. Quite honestly, you just have to screw that off. I won't take it all the way off now to have access to the two long machine screws and you can remove the outer assembly. And what you're left with is this. So how does this work? Okay, well, all of these stoves are designed pretty much the same in that the burner on the top is separated from the fuel line. So they come apart in two pieces like this. So that's where the little feed is for the burner and there's the burner and the fuel line. So what I have to do in order to use it with the Keith stove is I'll disassemble it to show you. Okay, so here is the fire grate. And when I looked at the fire grate, I said, wow, look at that center hole. I wonder, would it fit through? No, it didn't. It, this little piece did not fit through as it came. But it was so close, so close in fact, that all I did is took a round file and within 30 seconds, there were little corners and I just really, I rounded off those little corners and now it fits, fits perfectly. And then I can screw this on. And we're ready to go. And we put it in the elevation or the level that you would use for an alcohol stove. And I'll do that in a second. However, when I decided to use it with the notches that I machined, what I found is, is that getting it into the stove so that I could feed the line up through the center of the stove required me to take one of these ports, this one, and open one side up a little bit by about one millimeter. That way I can fit this through. Uh, for whatever reason, that took a good amount of time. I mean, yeah, titani titanium is very hard to file. So that's the reason that, you know, I had good files, good uh, nickels and files, but it took time to open that up so that I could feed this through. Then when I had discovered that I could just invert the stove for use with alcohol, then I discovered you could do the same thing for use with gas. So once again, the stove is sitting upside down. I'll take my plate and put it in. Now you can do it either, you can either put the wood or the gas burner on now or assemble the stove and then put the gas burner on. It's pretty much uh, the same process. Assemble my last side again. Remember again, I'm working with it upside down. Making sure I can see what I'm doing here. One, two, three, get the third one on. There we go. Okay, so it's all in place. And once again, oh, sorry, wrong place. I want it so it sits in these uh, openings down here. So I can put it back together in the right side position and then turn it upside down. Don't rush when you're doing this because that's when it seems that uh, 
it'll fall apart on you. Flip the stove over. So now the plate is near the top. Remember that it needs to be pushed down to that position. And now I can put the gas feed in through the open side. Oop, let's make sure you can see this. I can feed the gas thing, feed in through the open side. Up so it comes out through that little hole. Screw the burner on. It is easier than I'm making it look. There we go. Just trying to do it so you could see what I was actually doing. Okay. So now we're installed at a good height. Attach it to my gas canister. Guess I'm going to have to grab a lighter for this. I like remote feeds. Uh, you don't have to worry about too much heat being transferred down to the propane tank. You know, I've never had an issue, but uh, works perfectly. And now I can place a pot on top and bring my water to a boil very quickly. Okay, I'm going to have to give that a couple seconds to cool off. That quickly uh, does it start to heat up everything around it. Okay, I'll come back in a minute because I want to show you a comparison with a few other stoves in the same general design. All right, just before I show you a few comparisons, just a few more comments on something, that, another option you can do with the stove uh, for use with wood. So what I did is I took the stove apart, I removed the ash pan from the bottom of the stove, I took the fire grate and put it in the lowest position, which is that bottom notch here, and what that gives me, it gives me a little bit deeper, I mean not much, we're talking a little over half an inch, but I have now have a little bit greater depth to the burn chamber if I want to put in slightly larger pieces of wood. So one thing about that, of course, is now when you go to use this, you have to be even more careful to make sure that you're placing the stove on a fireproof surface and that it's not going to sink into anything soft that will include airflow in through the fire grate because, of course, it is open and now closer to the bottom of the stove. One benefit of that, of course, is besides the fact that you can get longer pieces of wood in, is that you're reducing the weight of the stove by the amount that the, uh, the ash pan weighs. Not that it's a whole lot, but if you're into uh, making things as light as possible, then you could do it this way. One other thing that occurred to me is using the stove like this inverted. Now, I have, this, I have a grill, a small grill, mind you, but I have a grill that I could put at least a good size hamburger patty on or a piece of chicken, maybe a small steak, or if I can move it around and make sure it's all cooked. The other thing that it allows me is if I really want to, I can set this either in coals in, a, in an open fire, or I can build my fire underneath the stove and I can feed in through the bottom. Now these are not manufacturer recommended, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you want to use it this way. I just wanted to show you a few extra options for using the stove in, uh, you know, to give you some uh, some options, I guess. Okay, couple uh, or one more small thing before we move on to doing some comparisons and that is I have had 10 or 11 fires. I just had another fire the other day. I think that makes 11 fires. And when I mean I have a fire, I'm not talking about just a few twigs. I usually fill this stove up with wood because it'll hold a lot of, a lot of wood, as you can see. I usually fill it up. I like using my stoves if the stove is designed for it and can tolerate it with a vertical stack, completely fill the burn chamber, start with a top-down burn and you'll get an extended burn time. Then that's the benefit, of course, but the downside is it burns really, really hot. And that extra heat may be of a disadvantage to stoves in terms of warping. Uh, so I've had a number of stoves or fires like that. Not all of them. Quite a few of them I put in where it just fit in through the side. That way you can keep a smaller fire going if you don't really need all that tremendous heat that it produces with a, a top-down burn. Uh, here's what I've noticed, and it's very minimal. If you look at the bars here, 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 I guess the four of them, they are relatively thin compared with the rest of the stove, and they are exposed to the heat. And this is true with when I'm using with alcohol, although that's not a great amount of heat, but they are exposed, I, and especially when I used it with gas, like I just had it set up a minute ago. Within a few minutes of the gas being turned on, these bars all get red, very red. Now, what happens is, of course, that's not hurting the integrity of the metal, but it does make them more malleable, and titanium can get very malleable, very soft when it's hot, is that 
if you're doing this with wood, the wood could be pressing outwards a little bit on the stove, resulting in a little bit of warping right along that edge right here. Now, it's insignificant, rest of the stove, nothing. Look, all the seams on the corners are all just perfectly aligned like they were when I first got the stove, and that's a due, of course, to the extra notch in the center. It's just this little piece up here. It does nothing to affect the performance of the stove. It is soft enough that you can push them back in if you don't like the look of it that way, or turn the plates around so now the, the bow is on the inside instead of the outside and the heat will re start moving it back towards the true anyway. Okay, that's just the, all I'm going to say about the stove. Let's do a few comparisons. So I have been asked by viewers after the original introductory video to show a couple of other stoves with this so that it will help them make a decision on what they may want to spend the money. In Canada, this stove runs about $80 to $85 Canadian. That's with free shipping from China. Uh, it will take you a little while to get it here, and you want to know, is it worth the, the expense? It is titanium. It is light. It's a heavy gauge titanium, so don't expect an ultralight stove, it, but it is lighter than something that would be made of steel. What do I have that is in the same category, maybe even has some similar characteristics? Well, how about the Emberlet in titanium? And the Emberlet is close in size but a little bit smaller. The burn chamber is smaller. There is some differences in design, but they're fairly close in design. The Emberlet is considered well, not considerably lighter. Of course, I'm going to put a comparison of all the sizes and everything in the video description. But it is a little bit lighter than is the Keith Titanium stove. But, you know, I, I love the Emberlet, don't get me wrong. But if anything warps, it's this one. This one can be very subject to warping. You can find after it cools down that it's kind of gone cocked. Uh, those crossbars, by the way, do help to resist it or at least push it back into shape when you go to use it. So that's one option. It is lighter. Uh, Price-wise, that depends on where you live. You can probably see some of the warping that's occurring on my Emberlet even there because, of course, it is thinner titanium. All right, how about another stove? Well, here's one that I'm still using. I'm not ready to give a review on, and that is the Firebox stove, Gen 2 Firebox in titanium. Uh, great stove. Can't beat these things. You know, uh, the, there's been an awful lot said about these stoves, and it's all true. It's all well deserved. The design is just simply outstanding. Uh, I can't fault this stove in any way, uh, you can see, except for the cost. Maybe that's one fault I could find with it because it is certainly much later than the stainless steel version is, so the downside, of course, is the cost. I haven't had so many fires in this yet that I've noted anything happening to it in terms of warping or anything else, so uh, I'm not ready to give you that kind of a long-term durability statement. But I just wanted to give you a size comparison between the two stoves. So the firebox is a little taller and a little wider, and I mean very little. And as you can see, if you look at the open sides of the firebox, it's almost identical to the Keith. This portion of the stove gives you a little bit more height. However, the Keith has a greater or larger, or sorry, a deeper burn chamber. Not by much, again, but a deeper burn chamber because the firebox has quite a bit of height or distance between the, the fire grate and the ash pan. Uh, so that's a, a good comparison in terms of size. Price is going to be considerably different. A lot of it has to do with what are you willing to give up from the firebox and in order to save money. Uh, Yes, this one's a lot more fiddly to put in together than the firebox. You can't beat that folding design. It's, it works out that well. Uh, this one is designed from the get-go to be used with, with the fire sticks for alcohol and gas, like a Trangia burner. So, you know, it has a lot more built into its original design. But once again, you're paying a lot more for this stove. So that's something you'll have to decide if, if the extra cost is worth it to you. Size-wise, they're close enough that I'd, I'd call them, you know, Pretty much an even draw. Yes, the firebox is a slight bit bigger, but not a whole lot. Okay, I have two other stoves. These are brand new to me, and you may, would have seen them in a recent video, and that is the Bush Box from Bushcraft Essentials, and I have it in two sizes. This is the XL version, brand new, hasn't had a fire in it, you can see. I'll get to testing this one shortly. Again, it is almost identical in size to the firebox, so everything that I said about the firebox in relation to the Keith stove holds for this stove. Uh, you know, I can't say anything about warping and long-term durability, but all the aspects of, of uh, 
versatility apply to this stove as they do to the LF. Now the LF may be the one, the LF being the large folder, uh, foldable stove, is just a tiny bit smaller than the Keith. But, uh, you know, again, a fairly close comparison. So there you go. There's some size comparisons for some different titanium stoves. All of them are more expensive, or all the three or the four comparison ones are more expensive than the Keith, but they all have some added value for them, such as the folding, the design that is, is intended for, uh, built right into it for versatility. But as I, you saw, with a little bit of creativity, this Keith can be used very versatilely. Okay, let's wrap this video up. You know, when I first started looking at the Keith Titanium Woods, though, when I first spotted it on AliExpress, I was uh, really intrigued by the design. It appeared, based on my experience I have with other wood stoves, that this would be a good performing stove. So when I reached out to Keith of USA and they agreed to send me the stove, and by the way, I would have bought this stove regardless, so I do want to thank Keith again for sending me this stove. It has, it is definitely a stove that I would purchase for myself. So when I, when I did purchase the, or receive this stove, it lived up to the expectations I had for, for use with wood. Uh, but then again, I started to think about it some more and realized, ah, it's not really designed for use with alcohol, so it's not as versatile as I had hoped it would be. But as you can see, with a little bit of creativity, you can make this stove a much more versatile performer. So now it works well with not only wood, it works well with charcoal, it works well with alcohol, and it works well with the propane butane gas cylinders. The only thing that I have not found a good way of using this stove with yet is with wood pellets. But you know, maybe a way, you know, a little modification with some screening. If you want to go that far, you can turn this into a pellet burner, I'm sure. Maybe you have some suggestions on how you would go about doing that. Okay, I think I've given you more than enough information that you can decide for yourself whether or not you want to purchase this stove. So what I will do is I'll put the link, or at least one link, in from AliExpress in the show notes where you can find it. And if you look around, just say Keith Titanium Wood Stove, I'm sure you'll find other links because there are a number of uh, sellers on AliExpress and probably on, e well, yes, on eBay as well. I'm not sure if this appears on Amazon. If it does, I'll put that link below. And as I mentioned already, I'll put all the other information for this stove its specifications as well as the comparison specifications for the other wood stoves I showed you. Okay, if you have any questions or you have any comments on the Keith Titanium wood stove, please put them in the comments section below. But until I'm ready to bring you another video to you, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.